What does it mean to deconstruct your faith? Hi, I'm Sheila Ray Gregoire from BearMarriage.com, where we like to talk about healthy, evidence-based biblical advice for your sex life and your marriage. And today, and actually for the next two weeks, we have some amazing interviews coming up with three different people who have deconstructed their faith. Now, deconstruction has gotten a lot of bad press in evangelicalism lately. Matt Chandler accused people of deconstructing just because it's sexy, as if deconstructing is something really cool to do. Lots of people say those who deconstruct are doing so because they want to sin. And actually, that's not what's going on. And it is so vitally, vitally important that we listen to the voices that are coming out of the deconstruction spaces. And that's why I want to dedicate the next three weeks to some interviews on that. What deconstruction means is simply that you're examining all the things that you were taught about God and about faith, and you're dismantling them one by one until you get down to the foundation of what you think is true. So you're taking out the stuff that's extraneous, basically the toxic teachings that we talk about here on Bare Marriage all the time, until you get back to what's true. The problem is so many people grew up with such horrendously toxic teachings and with people around them who had bought the toxic teachings and that they experienced such tremendous betrayal and hurt that they couldn't continue in the faith. And so we're going to hear stories today from Sarah McCannon, the author of Exvangelicals, and next week from Kate West, the author of Rift, of people who have really deconstructed because they they really, really believed and they were hurt. And they're still in their journeys. They're not sure where they're going to end up. And I've, I'm finding it very interesting to watch them on social media and see how they're processing things. And then we'll hear from Ryan George, author of Held and Healed by the Church, to look at how he had to deconstruct, but he ended up falling in love with a whole new Jesus that he'd never been introduced to. And that's really my heart, is that people who deconstruct end up finding the real Jesus. But I know that that's not going to happen for everybody because there has been so much hurt. And that's why it's so important for us to listen to these stories. When we ignore the stories of people who have deconstructed, we're basically saying we don't care if a whole generation leaves the church. And often the people who are deconstructing have noticed something really toxic, and we need to listen to them. And so we are going to bring on Sarah McCammon in just a minute. But before we do that, I do have some thank yous to give out. We just so appreciate the people who support what we do here. We love our patrons and our patron community on Facebook. Rebecca and Joanna have been recording up a storm this week of 12 unfiltered podcasts that they'll be releasing in the patron group. They've been having so much fun doing deep dives into things that they don't necessarily get to talk about on the public channel, but you can see some of the things that we're thinking about in the patron group. And so you can join our patron group for as little as $5 a month and be part of that Facebook group. And then for higher levels, you get even more perks. But we also have a chance in the U.S. to donate money to what we do. We are the Good Fruit Faith Initiative of the Bosco Foundation. And the Bosco Foundation is funding a lot of the research that we're doing, a lot of our research dissemination, some of the academic papers we're writing. We have some really cool things that we hope to be able to share with you in the next couple of weeks and months on that front. And it it also is funding our pastor outreach. We're preparing a lot of things for the new year on training pastors in some of the new information that we have gotten from our research. And so I just want to say a big thank you to some of our most recent donors, people who have given money just very recently to Donna, Rachel, Amy, Melissa, Hannah, Talia, Jessica, Melanie, Kirk, Melinda, Rebecca, and Brian. Thank you so much for your recent donations. And it really does make a difference. And you can even give on a monthly basis. And so the link to the Good Fruit Faith Initiative is in the podcast notes, as is the link to join our patron. And now, without further ado, I would like to bring to you our interview. And then after that, Keith's going to join me so that we can talk about some cool things as we process what we've heard. Well, I am really happy to bring to the Bear Marriage Podcast, Sarah McCammon who is a national political correspondent with NPR, which sounds super crazy this this year with all the elections coming up. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about her amazing book, Exvangelicals, which I loved. And Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you so much. It's good to be here. You know, I read a lot about Exvangelicals and because we're sort of in that space. And I think what I loved about your book, first of all, it's so well written, but your anecdotes and the stories of your own life, like it's so poignant and funny. And I just thought you did a great job. So thank you. It was a lovely read. It was a lovely, heartbreaking read. 
<laughs> Thank you. A lovely read. And it was um, nice as a journalist, you know, usually you stay out of things, but I obviously have my own experiences in this world and I wanted to share them, but also in conversation with a lot of other people's stories too. So, yeah, yeah, it was so good. So, you know, there's a lot of people who listen to this podcast on all ends of the spectrum of religion. And what we often hear in evangelicalism is the term expangelical, but it's not always defined. And mm -hmm. we get a lot of talk from a lot of pastors, especially accusing expangelicals of all kinds of horrible, heinous things. So how would you describe an expangelical? You know, I use this word, I use it in the title of my book because I feel like it's a nice shorthand and like any shorthand, it, it, it serves a purpose, but it doesn't say everything. You know, when I was, when I was in the evangelical world, that wasn't the word I would have used. I would have just used the word Christian, but I came to understand that, that I was part of an evangelical movement that meant something specific. And when I heard someone, you know, in the course of some of my reporting use the term exvangelical, I thought, you know, that is really an interesting word because it just kind of says very efficiently, I used to be part of this world, this really, is, what is a subculture in many ways. And now I'm not for whatever reason. It doesn't necessarily say where you are, who you are now. It just says I've had some kind of a break for whatever reason with that community. And I started paying more attention to that word after I heard it and seeing all these sort of, you know, around 2017, around seeing all these spaces online, you know, podcasts and hashtags and social media groups and so forth, where people were having really interesting and really heartfelt conversations about how to make sense of their faith and how to make sense of maybe some changes they were having in their faith. And I had been through that process myself many years before I ever heard this word. And so I think it means different things to different people. But I think what it means is I have some kind of a connection to the evangelical world. And for whatever reason, that connection has evolved and changed. And I'm now in a different place. And that different place can, it, it sounds like your listeners fall into a lot of different categories, but it can fall into a lot of different categories. For some people, that means not being religious anymore. And for other people, it still means being deeply Christian, but it might look different than what they were doing before. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the deconstruction movement is highly tied up in, in this whole ex-evangelical movement. And sometimes right. people deconvert and sometimes they just get rid of certain beliefs. And I think it's just a lot of questioning. And that's what I really appreciated about you know, you in the book, you wove in your own story, but then all these other people, just like a journalist, because you are one, you know, that you talk to about all these different aspects of trying to figure out faith when things just aren't working once you're an adult. And they right. probably weren't working as a teenager, too. So before we get going, okay, in Philippians 3, Paul does his whole, here's what I was, I was like, you know, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, I was so super religious. And now I don't consider myself any of that I consider it all junk. So Give us your bona fides because you were you were in the middle of evangelicalism. So, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, from preschool, halfway through preschool, I was afraid to go to preschool. So my mom let me wait until the second semester. I went to Christian school all the way through 12th grade, with the exception of one semester when I was a U.S. Senate page in Washington, D.C. And I write about that. It was a pivotal semester. It was this time I was exposed to people who thought differently than me. And it sort of raised a lot of questions for me. And then I went to a, an evangelical college. So I'll sort of, since we're speaking, I think kind of in the family here, I'll talk a little bit about what those specific traditions were for people outside of evangelicalism. I often say that evangelicalism is a huge umbrella term and it means a lot of different things. And it generally includes, you know, theologically and usually politically conservative Protestant Christians, but there are a lot of different ways to be that. So my Christian school was a Bible church school in Kansas City more toward the fundamentalist end of the spectrum, not fully fundamentalist, but, but really conservative. Girls wore dresses every day. We, it was, I guess, in some ways it'd be similar to a Baptist church, probably in terms of theology. My church that my parents went to was a charismatic, non-denominational non church. So similar to like an Assemblies of God, but not denominational, kind of Pentecostal. We raised our hands. We believed in the possibility of miracles. We spoke in tongues. I always tried to speak in tongues. I never really felt like I had it, but I tried <laughs> and prayed for it. And then my college was an evangelical free college, Trinity, which if people are familiar with seminaries, it's got a big seminary, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School outside of Chicago. I went to the undergrad college, which is pretty much now defunct, but 
that was 20 years ago or so that I graduated. So I kind of covered a spectrum of the evangelical world in those educational institutions and churches. And I had friends who were Baptists and friends who were Nazarene and friends who were conservative, like Missouri Senate Lutheran, lots of non-denominational folks. But, it, you know, we were all kind of unified by essentially the same theology with some small differences. Right. So good. So in your book, you talk about all kinds of issues that have caused people as they get older you know, to find that they just can't continue in the faith in the same way, whether it's, you know, politics, the LGBTQ issue, the issues of authoritarianism, uh, fear-based stuff of, of not handling mental health well. So you, you do all of this in the book, but I really want to focus on two chapters, which are not necessarily the main part, but they're the part that is going to resonate the most with our audience. Sure. Which is how you handled modesty and in the sex purity culture messages. So I, I laughed out loud. I mean, it was so pathetic, but at your story that opened your chapter on modesty about your homeroom teacher, you <laughs> wrote this so well, but can you, can you tell us about this buttoned up school yes. farm and what she did? <laughs> yeah. You know, we had this in my, this is my K-12 school. We had this very pretty strict modesty code, you know, girls wore dresses every day, at least below the knee. You could be asked if they look too short to kneel and demonstrate that your dress touched the floor. And I, I think I say in the book, I had a friend who went to public school for a while and then she came over to my school, but a friend from church who like, I think was kind of proud of herself for not having to go to Christian school initially. And she she knew about that and she said, Do you guys, is that because you kneel to pray all the time? <laughs> I was like, no, that's just the test. We're not that crazy. It's just the test of if our dresses are long enough. So I was a rule follower and I did not break dress code like ever, I don't think. But there were girls who'd like hike their skirts up, roll them just a little bit, or wear wear them, you know, just a little bit above the knee, just push the envelope. It was funny, our cheerleading uniforms, because I was a cheerleader for a couple of years, they were a little allowed to be just a little bit shorter because it's weird to have a cheerleading skirt that goes down to you, below your knee. Yeah. So they could come right above the knee. But some of the girls, again, would like we to roll them up just a little bit shorter, show some thigh. And, you know, it's funny, like the really tiny girls could get away with it more because they were like skinny and they didn't have these womanly frames. I was pretty curvy. And so I, I couldn't get away with anything and I didn't really try but yeah, one day I got to my first period class, which was kind of like a homeroom, although we used it to pray and have devotions every morning. And the my teacher, who was this really, yes, very buttoned up, very strict, kind of very serious type of person, she like sat down and told us she had to talk to us about something. And she basically starts like kind of doing this little pantomime where she hikes up her skirt and she unbuttons her button up shirt and shows us a little bit of cleavage. And it was, and her whole point was that like a lot of girls are dressing like this. And we were told that some of the male teachers had complained, which was really creepy. And that we, you know, all the women were having a, giving the girls a talking to about how we were not complying with dress code sufficiently. And so I got out of that class and found out that, you know, some of my other friends in other sections that had a similar performance from their female teachers, which is just weird, but also funny. The whole point was, you know, to reinforce this modesty code. And I talk in the book about how there was another occasion at my college where all the RAs did like a slutty fashion show where they, they you know, wore tighter, their tighter clothes and hiked up their skirts. And, you know, it's all kind of funny, but it's also... It's also not that funny because this was a message that was really, really hit hard for girls that like you need to cover up. If you're not covering up, you're going to lead your brothers astray. You're going to cause them to lust. and Or your male teachers. Or your, your male, male teachers, 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 even weirder, right? So, yeah, I mean, I, I still laugh about it, but I'm, you know, and if I had a daughter, it's not something I would ever want <laughs> For her to have to experience because it's just not appropriate. Yeah. And, and so many women that you talk to have really had long-term consequences from that, you know, not being able to accept their bodies, not, not feeling free once they're married, even like if, you know, they're in a good relationship, they're supposed to have this great sex that the church promised them, but they still feel like they can't even show their husband their body. Yeah. 
in that. And I, you know, I interviewed some women in my book who talked about, you know, really following all of those rules, really internalizing those messages. And then when they got to their married life, feeling like, as you described, just like they couldn't enjoy their sexuality, they couldn't enjoy their bodies. You know, one woman talked about having, you know, not had an orgasm until she was in her 30s. And I, you know, I've been fascinated with your research that that backs up the idea that this is this is a bigger problem for people raised in purity culture and modesty culture than it probably needs to be. Yeah, that it definitely needs to be for sure. And this this affected you too. I mean, you you really were this good Christian girl. You were trying to follow all the rules. You'd never kissed anybody. And then you told the story of your relationship with John, who's the guy that you, the, the only guy you dated before you got married, right. which ended up being, you know, sort of a, phys- a physical relationship you know, that, that to me sounded kind of exploitative or at least not. The only guy I, I really had a physical relationship, but I went on a few dates, but, but yeah. yeah, I had like my, my husband, my first husband that I married was my first actual boyfriend, you know, and I, and I really minimal relationships before that. But, but yeah, I, you know, I had, I had held out for a long time. I'd gone on a couple of dates in high school that didn't really go anywhere and gone on a few dates in college with different guys. And, you know, but there was this real sort of sense of needing to hold everything really close. And, you know, I think I mentioned in the book having, you know, a friend that I thought about making out with, I'd never kissed anybody. And I just didn't do it because, you know, literally if you kissed a kissed a friend, (laughs) you might end up finding yourself engaged in a few months because that was just how the culture worked. You know, there was, it was this extremely serious approach to any kind of physical connection and, and, and any kind of dating, you know, even casual dating was kind of frowned upon. It was supposed to be serious leading to marriage. And so, yeah, this, this boy ass man, man, who was 28, asked me out when I was like a sophomore or junior in college. And, you know, I had never even kissed anybody and I was really attracted to him. I was at that age where you're curious, right? Sexually. And I just remember feeling so conflicted because, you know, there were things I I wanted to do, but knew I wasn't supposed to do. He was for a lot of reasons, probably not somebody that I thought I would want to marry, but I was just so curious and so tired of having, of just waiting, you know, because all of this, everything has to be put off until you're basically ready to get married. And so, yeah, you know, we, we went out and I talk about, you know, what that was like and, you know, but just feeling like a lot of, a lot of guilt and also a lot of pressure like from him. And, and, and I think the thing about purity culture that I'm not the first person to point out is that it, it so emphasizes purity and not crossing any lines it doesn't talk much about consent or knowing your body or knowing what you want, which is a problem when, it, I mean, for me, it was a very confusing set of feelings. It's like, I wanted sex, right? I, I was, I was a 20, 21 year old woman, healthy. I wanted sex. I was attracted to men, but I also was terrified of sex. Mm-hmm. And I think being like physically close to a guy that I was really attracted to and having these incredibly conflicting feelings was so confusing. And so, you know, he would put pressure on me to do more. And I, you know, on some level wanted to, but on another level didn't. And, and I have to be clear. I mean, he, when I said no, it was absolutely his, his obligation to respect that regardless of why I was saying no. And so I just really struggled to navigate those negotiations because I was so out of touch with what I even wanted and felt so, I think, so removed from my own desires and feelings. And and so, you know, then I talk about when I did finally find the, the guy I wanted to marry who had not dated before, just feeling a lot of guilt that I'd done anything physical at all. And I'm just talking about I'm really just talking about making out with clothes on, like nothing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry if that's too much. I don't know how how much do we go no. into in this yeah. podcast, but but I, I guess what really <laughs> struck me too is is and this coincided with so much of our research is you were actually in quite a vulnerable position there, like, <laughs> and you really were not equipped to handle it. Like it could have gone a lot worse. Oh, right? yeah. If he had, I mean, if he had pushed farther. Yeah, and you really weren't equipped to handle it. Not that any of us ever are equipped to handle sexual assault. I don't mean to say that, but I just mean that there's a level of naivete that came with mm-hmm. that, that we saw a lot in our focus groups where, you know, there, because there wasn't that emphasis on consent, it really was your job to stop everything. And, yes. And, yes. Uh, 
yeah, it just puts you in a bad position. So then you come out of that relationship and you marry the very next guy who's the perfect for you on paper. He mm. is the son of an SBC pastor. He's done everything right, you know, and you're supposed to have this great marriage and you didn't. Yeah. I mean, I remember when we were dating and I want to say he and I are on good terms. I dedicate the book to him and to my children and to my, I'm remarried to my, my spouse, my husband, but we, you know, we tried so hard to do everything right. Both of us and, and bless his heart. You know, he, I remember when we were dating, he would say things like, I really want to do right by you. You know, like I really want to guard your heart. And, you know, these various kind of sweet ideas from purity culture, but that like to execute on them is very difficult when you have no frame of reference for like who you are in a romantic relationship or who you are sexually or anything like that. And he, you know, I, I, I remember feeling like as soon as we started dating, I, and I think, and he, he's not here and I don't, I don't want to speak for him, but my sense is that I think both of us kind of felt that once we started dating like that, we were like to, to break up or to not get married, it would be a really big deal. And he had been raised in, in the Bill Gothard environment, you know, the, the ATI, I, IFB that's profiled in shiny, happy people. My church had been influenced by it. So we both had like, not just, not only the idea that we should save sex for marriage, but, but a bit more of an extreme version of that kind of courtship, you know, almost toward courtship kind of philosophy, both of our parents did. And that meant that there was very little room for error. Like there was very little room to just spend time with somebody figure out how to be in a romantic relationship, figure out what you like. I'm not even just talking about what you like sexually, but what you like in a relationship, like what it feels like to be supported in a relationship, what it feels like to be, you know, to be, to be romanced, you know? And I don't think either of us knew what that was like. And so, you know, there was just so much pressure to like not break any rules, to get married soon, to settle down, to be adults really fast. And you know, for a whole lot of reasons, which I, you know, I don't go into too much detail in the book out of respect for him. There were just a lot of things that never were quite right. <laughs> and, yeah. and we tried, we really tried to make them work. And I think we, we stayed together for a long time and we have two wonderful kids and we co-parent and I'm really grateful for that part of my life. But I also, I also think that had we entered that relationship with less fear, it might've been very, very different. Mm -hmm. You put at the end of one of your chapters, this is, this is highly personal. So I'm sorry to read it out loud <laughs> and put you, you can, in the spot. Anything in the but, book is fair game. <laughs> but you taught, you, you say this, for most of our marriage, I had a recurring dream. The setting changed each time. Sometimes we were at his parents' house, sometimes in my childhood bedroom, sometimes a place I didn't recognize, but the circumstances were always the same. We were alone wanting to touch each other, but there were people moving around outside our door. Never sure if the door was locked, we'd move from room to room with a growing sense of frustrated desire with no opportunity to act on it without embarrassment and shame. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, without consummation, the dream would end. Yeah. Yeah. I had a lot of dreams about sexual frustration around my spouse, even after we were married. And I think it was because it was always, it felt so controlled and supervised and you know, in a way, like it's never really yours when there are this many rigid ideas about how it should be. And, you know, I even remember like a real embarrassment on my wedding day with the idea that everybody knew that I was going to have sex for the first time that night. Like that was really, and it was true. I hadn't had sex, neither had he. And, you know, we'd done all the right things. And I remember being really embarrassed about that. It felt like something so intimate and so private. And the idea that everybody knew the timing and it wasn't ours to choose really was, was really hard for me. And then I remember, you know, the morning after at the airport and when we flew off on our honeymoon, my mother-in-law <laughs> was there and it was just so uncomfortable because it's like, you know, everyone is, everyone is thinking, oh, they just had sex. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it's not something you should be embarrassed about. Like probably most couples have sex on their wedding night, but, but the idea that like something so momentous and intimate, you know, would, would be in a way like not witnessed, but kind of witnessed by everybody. That was really hard for me. And I think it, I think it created a lot of stress around our honeymoon. Yeah. 
you know, when I, when I look at the stories in the book, what I see is a lot of pain. There's people in a lot of pain who are doing a lot of work to try to get healthy. Mm -hmm. And, and yet when I hear people within evangelicalism talk about the ex-evangelical movement or the deconstruction movement, whatever you want to call it, there's a lot of anger and there's not a lot of acknowledgement of that pain. Instead, there's, there's more blame quite often, you know, people just want to sin or they're just whatever, whatever it might be. How can we get to the point where, or, or is there any way that you think we can get to the point where people understand this is really about pain? Like this hurt people Mm -hmm. tremendously. And it isn't just purity culture. It's the whole package that was authoritarian and fear-based and exclusionary and everything. I I wish that there would be more of a willingness to listen, you know, to that, because I think that is one of the most, one of the most hurtful things. And I felt this to varying degrees from people within the evangelical world, as I have struggled with different parts of it, is this sort of censure that comes with that, like this sense that you must be doing it wrong, or you must have done it wrong, or you must have not been sincere or really tried, or really loved Jesus, or really read the Bible, or really prayed enough. And it's like, I think I did all of those things. And I still pray. I still ask God every day, pretty much, to help me find the right path, to help me do the right things. I care about that a lot. I care about that, but I have come to different conclusions than some people who I you know, used to be close to, or have been close to, or maybe would be close to if we went to the same church, you know, back in the day, I'm just people from, from the evangelical community. And I wish, I think there are those who are willing to hear that. And I appreciate that so much, but I think, uh, frankly, I think that some of, some of us who question things are, I'm sure it feels threatening. I mean, I used to feel threatened by that myself when, you know, when I would be around people who saw things differently. I sometimes found that destabilizing to my own point of view. And I, yeah, I just wish that there was more of a willingness to listen. I will say I did a story and I mentioned it in the book several years ago, all things considered was doing our NPR's afternoon news magazine was doing a series on sex and somebody wanted to do something on purity culture. And they knew that I grew up that way. So they asked me, Hey, Sarah, can you do the story? And we did the story where we talked to this really lovely couple who are, at least at the time of the story, and probably still are, uh, evangelical. They had waited for marriage. But they were really honest about the fact that, like, some of the messages from the church have been harmful. And they said that they specifically were grateful for people in their lives who were honest with them about sex, who, who were willing to have sort of, you know, very honest, frank conversations, who didn't who didn't frame it as this sort of end all be all thing that they were going to screw up if they didn't do it right or stepped out of line. And, you know, I just appreciated from this couple who are even evangelicals, this willingness to say the church doesn't get it right all the time. And we understand that some people are hurt by it. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, even that would mean a lot. <laughs> and yeah. I'd say in the book, I think that many people, you know, I talk about my mother and I think many of the intentions were good. Like I think my, Parents and many other evangelical parents wanted to protect their children from pain and from, you know, from casual relationships that might be hurtful. And and goodness knows, like, there there are other really bad ways to do sexuality besides purity culture. You know, I mean, abusive sex, non-consensual sex, sex that uses people, right? Like, purity culture is not the only the only harmful way to do this. And I think it was an attempt by well-intentioned people in many cases to avoid those kinds of harms. The challenge is that like people and emotions and sexuality don't fit into a little formula that way. And there were for many of us unintended consequences. And I just would have appreciated if more people who are still sort of immersed in the movement would, would just acknowledge that, you know, and, and maybe reflect on how to make it better. We actually have some stats to prove that because in our book, She Deserves Better, when we surveyed 7,000 predominantly evangelical women, what we found is that the people who had deconstructed the most tended to be the people who had believed the hardest, Mm -hmm. who had believed the most. And the people who still believed some of the toxic stuff were people who just hadn't necessarily, there was sort of two, two, two groups, either they hadn't necessarily bought into it to the same degree and they weren't quite as religious, or they just hadn't 
had any of the negative effects. So you had a bit of survivorship bias there. Mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, for people who are still, who, who don't see purity culture as harmful, I think often there is a big survivorship bias and they don't realize, well, no, I just was one of the lucky ones. Right. Right. And I, yeah. I think like that, and I always say like, I'm not here to talk anybody out of anything. Like if you're happy and if you're happy in an evangelical marriage to like, fantastic. You know, I mean, if people are happy, that's great, but it's just sort of important to acknowledge that it doesn't work that, out that way for everybody. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And this, and the, the whole purity culture and the extreme authoritarian control and patriarchy really, really mm. doesn't work. You talked about your mom and that's another theme that came up a lot in your book is, is the immense pain that it causes when you lose contact with your family or where you're, when your family doesn't want anything to do with you because you've rejected evangelicalism in some way. Can you speak to that? Yeah. And I, and I'm, I'm not estranged from my family and I hope, I hope not to be. <laughs> I, I did send my parents some of the, like the most difficult sections of the book before I published it months ago. And, and that was a difficult conversation. And I, you know, they asked me to keep most of that conversation private. So I am, but I will say that I, I didn't want to blindside them. And I, wanted them to, I, I considered their feedback. I also had to talk about my childhood and my family in order to, to tell my own story. There's no way around that. So I tried to strike a balance and, and also acknowledge again, some of the, the good intentions that were behind a lot of these things, but yes, it, you know, I think a lot of times evangelicalism, like probably any religious system is it's as, it's as much about identity as it is about beliefs and not to minimize the importance of beliefs, but the identity piece is a really big piece of it. And so when you have a change in your beliefs, however sincere it is, however, honestly, it's been come by, however painful it might've been to arrive there, that change in beliefs can feel like an attack on the identity mm -hmm. and like a betrayal and a moving away. And I've never wanted that. I've never intended that, but I understand that that can be the impact sometimes. So, you know, one of the big themes in the book is sort of tension between my parents and my grandfather who, you know, who, who didn't believe the way that we believed. And unfortunately that I feel like that, that tension has been a theme in our family and it's, it's one I've tried to overcome. I've always encouraged my children to have a, whatever relationship with their grandparents they desire. And but it's but it's hard when you see things very differently and and also when there is some some pain and even trauma there from again things that were well intentioned but nonetheless painful and so i you know i think for me it's just been a matter of trying to delicately navigate that for people that i several people that i talk to in the book and i would say this is true for me too you know i you hear a lot of talk about boundaries and the idea that there are just some things that Mm -hmm. You maybe don't talk about or don't talk about in certain ways in order to protect the relationship. And that's that's what I heard from so many of those stories that you shared was th these younger people desperately wanted to keep a relationship with their parents, but they found that it was really difficult to because their parents were the ones who were rejecting them. And that right. made me really sad. And I know there's a lot of parents listening to this podcast who maybe have you know, kids in their 20s or late teens or even in their 30s who are going through this deconstruction process. What, what would you say to them? Hmm. I'm so glad you asked this question because I've had a couple of parents come to me at book signing events in recent weeks. In one case, it was, I think, a, I think it was a mother and daughter. In another case, it was a couple that told me that they are their whole family was kind of going through different stages of deconstruction, but it had been a lot more difficult for their adult children. And they were trying to understand what their adult children were going through. And I've also gotten at least one private message or two along these lines. And I'm being generic here because I don't want to expose any confidence, but I think I can broadly say I, I've heard from a few different people who are in a position along those lines. And it, first of all, it's really, it's really encouraging to me when I hear from parents who are at least willing to acknowledge, you know, I think my kids went through something I didn't realize they were going through and I'm trying to understand what it was. And I'm trying to understand my role in that. I, I just, I, I, I hope that those conversations will continue. I hope people will read this book with an open heart and understand that like, I think most people want their parents to love them 
you know? I mean, it's like such a basic human need. And it's so difficult when you feel like they don't love you for who you are. And like there are conditions on that. And I understand that people have strong beliefs and strong moral beliefs and have, you know, in some cases are very worried probably about their children's souls and their spirituality. And I understand that. And I, I I guess, I mean, I can't really, I don't, I try not to give a lot of advice, but if there's any advice I would give, I think it would just be to try to love your kids, you know, try to love them. And I, I think, I mean, I'm a mom, right. And I, my kids are, are teenagers now. And I think sometimes like, what could they do that would make me not want to be around them or, and I'm sure there are lots of things. I mean, if they did something really terrible, it'd be really hard for me. And, and I, I hope that never happens. And, and I hope that I would navigate it in the right way. But then I don't think that people who are deconstructing are doing something terrible. Like it's not, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It's not like we're killing someone or something yeah. or committing some kind of horrible crime. It's just, it's just arriving at a different place. And I think there are evangelical parents who are able to hold on to very strong beliefs and still express love. And I, but I think it's hard for a lot of them for whatever reason. And so, mm-hmm. and maybe there's a fear of if you get too close to someone, even your own child, who's different, it will in some way start to unravel things for me too. You know, maybe that's part of the fear. I really don't know. I wish I had an answer, but I am encouraged that I think some people are at least asking the question. Yeah. That seems like a good place to start. Yeah. And I I think that's one of the overwhelming things I got from your book is that the people who are deconstructing and who are coming into the evangelical movement, they're not like, (laughs) you know, they're not like this angry army who wants to, to burn everything down. They just, they're hurting and they just want health and they want wholeness and they want that acknowledged. Right. And the hurt acknowledged. And I think that's a fair thing to ask, even if you don't land on the same place, you know, religiously, I think that's a fair thing to ask. And so I really appreciate what you wrote. I appreciate all the people's stories that you, that you put to paper and honored them too, honored their stories. So thank you for doing that. And we will put a link to the Expangelicals in the podcast notes. Where can people find you, Sarah? I am on Substack. That's usually where I send people. I have a Substack called Off the Air because it's sort of what I write about behind the scenes of being an NPR reporter. And also I write a lot about religion and politics and various things that interest me. So that's one place. I'm also on Instagram, Sarah McCammon underscore journalist. So those are probably the two best places to find me. Awesome. I will put those links down there too. Well, thank you very much. (laughs) Well, thanks so much, Sheila. Thanks for your work. It's really good to talk to you. If you're wanting to change the conversation about sex and marriage with us, we have an amazing resource that can help. It's our Great Sex Rescue Toolkit, and it has downloads that are really pretty that you can send to people to explain the harmful effects of the obligation sex message, of the modesty message on teen girls, you know, of the idea that all men struggle with lust, and so much more. It's also got all of our one sheets in it of the books that we've that we've looked at, and some great tips on how to talk to people about why things are harmful and why we need to change the way that we teach about them. The toolkit is just an amazing resource. There's lots of videos in there for me to help you out. And we've priced it at pay what you can. So you can get it for as little as $3 or you can give a whole lot more if you want to support us. So the link to that is in the podcast notes. All right. Well, I have brought my husband Keith on the podcast. Hey, everybody. And I really appreciate Sarah telling her story and writing her book. It honestly is a really good overview of deconstruction and ex-evangelicals. And I highly recommend getting it because I think we need to listen to these voices. It's really important. But, you know, the reason that I wanted to talk to you today and bring you on is because ever since I read Lies Young Women Believe, which we talked about last week on the podcast, I've just been processing a lot of things and Mm -hmm. thinking a lot of things that kind of relate to this deconstruction. And I think it can be summed up best by a Facebook post that was shared in our patron group this week about the Robert Morris incident. Do you know? Yes. The Robert Morris, what's a a good word? Betrayal, 
horrendous abuse. Crime. Crime. That's a good <laughs> word. <laughs> yes. For those of you who don't know, Robert Morris is or was the lead pastor of Gateway Church, which is a mega church in, I think, the Dallas area. And he resigned a week after a victim came forward, a woman, Cindy Clemisher, I believe is her last name, to say that 35 years ago when she was 12, he sexually abused her for four years. Mm-hmm. And he had been portraying this to the church as an inappropriate relationship with a young lady, mm-hmm. a young lady. Yeah. A 12 year old is not a young lady. Right. She is a child. And so he did, he did resign. I wish he had been fired. And I hope the church actually looks into the dynamics that both led to the abuse and led to the elders not investigating it and not being curious and dismissing those who brought things up. So I hope it isn't just swept under the rug. But all that being said, there was a Facebook post that was shared in the patron group about this. And a woman said, like, like this was a friend of hers had written this, and she she went to Gateway. And the post on the on the whole wasn't wasn't bad. Like it was it was very open that Robert Morris had done what was wrong. It wasn't defending Robert Morris, but it was what she said about the victim that really got me because she said, "We just need to keep praying that the victim will be able to forgive and won't be taken up by bitterness." Mm-hmm. And it just struck me how similar this was to the message in Lies Young Women Believe. Yeah where the issue is all about your own emotions and whether you have forgiven and is not at all about addressing the harm that's been done to you, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And I think this is, this is really the story of my faith growing up, like not, not with my mom, not in the little churches I belong to, you know, in those churches, I really believed that God loved me, that Jesus called me friend. I, I would go for walks and talk with Jesus. Jesus was very much, was very real to me, very compassionate to me, very close to me. But as I got more into parachurch organizations, into missions organizations, I went on Teen Missions International, which was my first experience with fundamentalism and was very destructive. I I heard a different version of Christianity, which was everything was about whether or not I had the right emotions. So if I was angry at something, I needed to forgive and make sure that I wasn't bitter. And if I was still hurt by something, that was a sign that I hadn't forgiven. And so I need, and, and, you know, coming from family where my father walked out when I was very young and I had very little to do with him, I was constantly needing to process that as a kid. Lots of kids have to process the way their parents hurt them. And this message that the reason I was hurt was because I hadn't forgiven rather than the reason I was hurt was that my dad did something bad to me. Mm-hmm. And that needed to be acknowledged and healed. Yeah. Was really destructive because, and, and I've said this before on the podcast and in my speaking engagements, but I ended up seeing God kind of like a magazine cover, you know, where it's like seven ways you could be doing better, <laughs> five ways you could get more done today, four yeah. ways you could have a better attitude. It was like God, God loved me. But he was always disappointed in me because I was never just right. And every time I had this negative emotion, and emotions are not negative, okay? <laughs> but but we tend to think of them that yeah. way. Like anger tells us something. Sadness tells us yeah. something. When, whenever you have the emotion that in your culture, you're not supposed to have. Yes. Which is in itself an unhealthy thing. But. <laughs> right. And so faith, in as I grew up in increasingly fundamentalist circles, Faith became about whether I could get my emotions under control for God and, you know, be joyful and grateful in everything so that I never experienced sadness, loneliness, frustration, anger. Because if I did, I was in sin and I wasn't seeing God right. Mm -hmm. And so faith was entirely about me. And somehow I missed Mm -hmm. that that's not what scripture is about primarily. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's why a lot of people are deconstructing, right? Because basically they're getting to a situation where they're realizing that the way that my faith is expressing itself, the way I've been taught of what faith means, doesn't line up with what's actually in scripture. Yeah. And so the question is, you know, Jesus himself said to be wise and build on rock. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people in the church are going, have I built on sand? Yeah. And they're trying to figure out, you know, have I built on sand? 
and 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 they're honestly wrestling with their faith, trying to follow the words of Jesus. And then Matt Chandler tells them, you just want to sin yeah. and dismisses them, which is ridiculous. <laughs> yes. And one of the big things to me that I think a lot of people are deconstructing is this whole idea of faith being this individualistic, personal, like me and only me mm -hmm. and God. And that is it. And community is not part of it. You know, the, over, mm -hmm. the picture of the whole, the body, that's not part of it. It's all about me and what I'm feeling and what I'm doing as opposed to making things right in the community where we all share in making a better world for everybody. Yes, that's what was missing. I was missing the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was missing the kingdom yeah. of God and how much Jesus talks about the kingdom and how it is community. I mean, even think about communion. You know, when he instituted yes. communion, it was, it was like when you guys are all together. Yes. Do this in remembrance of me. It, it's, a, it's a community event. And I made faith so individual because that's what was taught to me. Yeah, that's the way that Western evangelicalism is wired right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it started in, I mean, we'd have to go back into history lessons. And so I might be doing a very bad job of this. But <laughs> like, you know, I think of it as the Billy Graham idea where we're yeah. going to have a crusade yeah. and it's all about individuals accepting Christ. Yeah. But then the big problem the Billy Graham crusade always had was there was no follow up. And so they were, they were always trying to get together with churches so that there would be follow up but it, but it was it was a constant battle yeah. right but the idea was we got all these people saved because they said the prayer but what did that and i'm not i'm not trying to diminish salvation but salvation is not it's, just it's more than just saying a prayer though exactly and that's the point is so you know there's a lot of balance in the christian life right so mm -hmm. it is important for me to mm -hmm. have my relationship with God right. Yes. Like, we're not saying well, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. right? But it's also important to live in community. And the Bible is full of exhortations to live in community in a healthy way. Yeah. But for some reason, we ignore all that and we focus on the vi verses that are very individual. And we see the verses that are mm -hmm. community-based as individual because we are so trained to think with that sort of mindset. Yeah. Like, for instance, even the verse you quoted about do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance mm -hmm. of me. Mm -hmm. We read that verse and we think, when I personally am sitting in the pew at church during communion Sunday and I'm taking that little bit of drink, mm -hmm. I should be thinking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. But that's, it says, do this when you, plural, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. in remembrance of me. Like it's meant to be a community thing, but we see it as individual yeah, because so we see so everything that, as so individual. So that the community is transformed, yeah. so that the community is a place of healing, yes. so that the community is a safe place. Yeah. So we and each instead, individual are running toward Jesus, but as a group, we are also running Right. And Jesus. instead what we're told is, and we talked about this in Lies Young Women Believe, even if your community is hurtful, you need to stick there and you need to yeah. forgive and you need to all this stuff. Yeah. And then, and then the whole sin leveling, right? Yeah. So it becomes like, okay, so Robert Morris sexually assaulted a girl. Mm -hmm. And that's a sin. Mm -hmm. And I hope she doesn't become bitter because that will be a sin too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, you know, it's ridiculous. And I, I, I want to go wash my mouth with soap mm -hmm. for even like equating those two things. But that's what happens when we boil it down to he's individually responsible for a repent of his sin and she's individually responsible for a repent of her sin. As opposed to us as a community going, this is mm -hmm. an incredible injustice and it needs to be made right. Mm -hmm. And he needs to pay for what he did and she needs to be restored and healed. Mm -hmm. That's what we should be saying. And that's what I want to talk about is what does it mean to be restored and healed? And Marg Mousko, who I love, I need to have her on the podcast one day because uh, Mar Marg, Marg is actually one of the few people that I interact <laughs> with online that I've met in real life twice. Yeah. I've also met Sarah McDougall twice, but I've met Marg Mousko twice and she's in Australia. So that's yeah. quite a feat, but I love Marg. She does incredible work, incredible scholar looking at the original languages around some of the passages that we wonder about with, with women women and men and gender in the church. And she writes these really super short articles. And on her website, you can look up any passage and see all the articles she's written on that. So I will put a link to her website. But she shared something on Facebook recently, which was from another guy called Larry Lynn, who I also really appreciate. Okay. And he posted this, and I want to read it to you. Some say that the New Testament doesn't talk much about justice, but actually it depends on your language. The Greek word... Ah, what is that word? You should say it's it. It's probably dikaiosune. Yes, that's is, what it is. Is it dikaiosune? Yes. yes. Appears 92 times in the New Testament. For example, Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for... Dikaiosune. Dikaiosune. Germanic language Bibles translate this as righteousness or something similar, but Romance language Bibles use yeah. justice. Yeah. So English says righteousness. German says... Gerechtigkeit. Yes. Okay, so that means... Gerechtigkeit means like right, and yeah. kite is like ness. 
Yes. So like making things right. Making things right. Yeah. yeah. And then in Latin, it's justitia. In Spanish, it's justicia. In Portuguese, it's justiça. In French, it's justice. 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 I should know that. Yes, my <laughs> Quebecois friends. And so in any of the le- Romance languages, justice is all over the New Testament. Yeah. But it's not there in English. Yeah. Because and and the problem is we think of righteousness as this individual yep. thing. So when we hear whoever hungers and thirsts for righteousness, so whoever hungers and thirsts to be to to for, be right with God, yeah, for them personally to have a good standing with God and do the right things, exactly. But that's not yeah. actually what the word the word means. More what you said the German word means yeah. to do what is right to yeah. make right. Yeah. Yeah. And throughout the scriptures, that yeah. is one of the big hallmarks of the kingdom of God is that we make things right. Yeah. And and so when you look at the situation with Robert Morris, it's not just, it's not about her forgiving. It's about how are we going to make this right with her? Are we going to pay for her trauma counseling? Mm-hmm. Are we as a church going to stand up and not give the pastor a standing ovation? For resigning. Right. Yeah, but, 40 years after the fact. But whatever. instead, are we going to lament and repent and yeah. tell her that it was never her fault? Yeah. You know, are are we as a church going to do that and, and try to make it right? Because so much of justice is people just want to be heard and mm-hmm. acknowledge that their pain mattered. Yeah. And instead of acknowledging that, we're yelling at people for still having pain. Yeah. You haven't forgiven. You're bitter. Not, you know, you have trauma. Mm-hmm. And that's real and trauma is stored in the body. And we want to help you get counseling. We want to help you heal on this side of heaven, not just that side of heaven. Mm-hmm. And that seems to be what's missing. You yeah. know, it is like we, we're missing how much justice is in the Bible. Yeah. And again, people get accused of not being biblical when we say things like, you know, she needs to learn to forgive. Mm-hmm. That's just a, well, biblically, she does need to learn to forgive. That's the Bible. Mm-hmm. It's like, but, but you're misinterpreting the Bible. That's why people are deconstructing, right? Yes, that's Cause, why. Because <laughs> you read the Old Testament, all through the Old Testament, right? Mm-hmm. When does God ever say, how long, old oh, people, will you hold bitterness against those who have oppressed you? <laughs> like, does that ever happen? Right? Yeah. The, the, all through the Old Testament, through the Psalms, it's, God is calling out for justice. Those who are hurting others need to stop. Mm-hmm. Like there's never a, why are you so bitter? Why are, why are you unforgiving for those who have done mm-hmm. bad to you? Mm-hmm. Like, where is that in the Bible? Yeah. Right. I mean, I still think it's right to learn to forgive for your own personal healing. Yes. But when we make it a sin that a person who has been wronged mm-hmm. is having a hard time to forgive, mm-hmm. we're so far out of the Bible and the Bible's idea of justice. Yeah. We have no right to speak. Yeah. And yet those are the people that are saying, you deconstructors, you know, yeah. aren't true to faith. Yeah. You're being more true to faith because you want to get to what God actually, what God's heart actually is. Yeah. Of what community is supposed to look yeah. like. It's supposed to be a safe place yeah. where people can heal and grow. Yeah. I mean, just justice and righteousness are inextricably linked. Mm-hmm. Certainly in the Old Testament. I mean, I love that. One of my favorite verses is the one in Amos, right? Let justice roll like mighty rivers and righteousness like mm-hmm. a never failing stream. Yeah. Justice and righteousness go together. Mm-hmm. Like Doing what is just and and doing what is right in the world, that's what righteousness is. Mm-hmm. It isn't practicing little acts of piety where I show how spiritual I am. Yeah. That's not what righteousness is. Yeah. Righteousness is I do what's right and I make sure what's right gets done. Yes. So. Yeah. And I make things right. There was a woman named Nikki left a really good comment mm-hmm. on the Facebook page when we were talking about this. And, and she says this, I think evangelical Christianity really does love justice, but it's often defined incorrectly. Justice in an evangelical power focused narrative means mm-hmm. punishment. It's the bad guys getting some sort of punitive payback. Whereas in scripture, justice is usually the thing that happens to the one who has been wronged. Until we shift that paradigm, the focus will be all off and not just for abused women in miserable situations, but for other people exploited in systematic patterns of injustice. Yeah. And that is so true. It, you know, in the Old Testament, when it talks about justice, it doesn't talk about, you know, punishing the wrongdoer nearly as much as it talks about recompense for the victim. Yeah. Like, what are you doing to help the widow and the orphan? What are you doing to help those people? And let's make sure that they get their fair share of everything. Let's give them more land. Let's give them, you know, help. Make let's sure give them sustenance. Let's take care of people who need it. That is is throughout the Old Testament. And yet we we focus so much on punishment for the wrongdoer. And I'm not against punishment for the wrongdoer. <laughs> but what are we doing to make things right? Right. What are we doing to make things right? And you know, if we asked more of those questions, 
there would be fewer people deconstructing. Yep. Or they'd be deconstructing, you know, I still think there'd be a lot to deconstruct because if we ask in those questions that we are deconstructing. <laughs> and again, I am not trying to malign those who have deconstructed and aren't and, and just can't line up with the Jesus of the Bible anymore that they've been taught because I totally get it. You know, if you've been in a system where you've been taught horrible, toxic things, mm-hmm. it's really hard to see the Bible as anything other than horrible and toxic. Like we have poisoned people. Basically, by giving all these toxic teachings, it's as if we've vaccinated people against the real Jesus. Mm. Because we've given them a taste, but the wrong taste, and now it's very hard for them to see. And again, I am not, this is, this is such a fine line because I really respect people's journeys and I understand why they're there. It's just my heart so much is that we could get this message right, that we could get scripture right, that we could get Jesus, the person of Jesus right. And so I, I just pray that we will listen to the people who are deconstructing because they're pointing out some really important things that have been wrong. And as a church, we are never going to grow in justice or righteousness or right. anything unless we start getting this stuff right. Mm-hmm. And unless we start realizing that the problem with the victim is not that she can't forgive. The problem is that it hasn't been made right yet. Yeah, It hasn't been made right in the Robert Morris situation. And for those who want to read more about the Robert Morris situation, I will put links in the podcast notes. I will put links to Sarah's book, you know, of course, to our Patreon and our and, and how you can give through the Bosco Foundation and to other things that we've mentioned. But before we go, I also want to read, because this kind of reflects on deconstruction too, some of the newest reviews that have come in for She Deserves Better, which is us inviting people to deconstruct <laughs> <laughs> the things that they were taught as teenagers and cling yeah. to the real Jesus. And I have two reviews to read, two short ones on Amazon. And by the way, I don't know why, like this stuff happens, I'm not always sure why, but She Deserves Better, The Great Sex Rescue, and Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex are all really cheap in paperback on Amazon right now. I don't know how much longer they're going to be cheap, (laughs) but they're like around 11 bucks each. So now is a great time to buy yourself a paperback version or to buy one for a friend. So here's just one. Here's the first review, and this is titled, I Wish I Had This Book as a Teenager. This is a must read for every single girl who grew up in purity culture and for both moms and dads of teen girls. Get this book and read it. Read it with your spouse, your kids, your children anyone you can get to open it. It teaches a healthy view of boundaries, relationships, hormonal changes during puberty, and gives good God-honoring advice for how to follow God as a teen girl without being legalistic or shaming. This book is worth its weight in gold, and I wish I'd had it as a teen. Isn't that lovely? That's great. But That's here's so nice. one that I, I that really touched me, okay? And this is written by a guy. He says this, my adult daughter asked me, her dad, to read this book. She was taught many of the ideas scrutinized by these authors and now raising her own daughter. She wants something better for her and for us as grandparents to understand why. Thankful she challenged me to read this with an open mind. That's awesome. And can I just say thank you to the grandparents out there who are listening to your kids as they deconstruct? Because this is what it takes to to have a healthy community is to is to be open to where we may have misled people. We may have taught things that were wrong, but just because you taught things that were wrong in the past does not mean that you need to keep doing that. It does not mean that we need to pass this on to the next generation, but we can actually make a shift as this family is doing. And I love that. I love that so much. Again, I mentioned our toolkit. You can find that in the podcast notes too, so that we can keep changing the conversation to something healthy. And that's what I want us to do. That is our prayer here at Bear Marriage. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, honey, for being yeah. on. Thanks for inviting me. It's and great. And next week, we'll have another story, Rift by Kate West, who was also deconstructing and ended up in a slightly different place. So thank you, and we'll see you again next week. (laughs) Bye-bye.